Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, POV Behind the Scenes of an Original Series, an online panel which is part of the program for Vitsi Jury Award Singapore 2021. Uh, so if, if you have been here earlier, what you've just seen is our festival trailer, giving you a glimpse of hand-picked local storytelling that are in the running for prizes, and also the Queen of Hearts trailer, giving you a glimpse of the series we are here to talk about today. So a big thank you you for joining us this afternoon and tuning in from wherever you are. Uh, we'll be running a live Q&A in the last 20 minutes of the webinar. So we have enabled the Q&A feature. Uh, it is on the bottom of your screen in Zoom. So if you have any questions at all, just pop them in the text box. Uh, you can put them in along the way and we will get to them towards the end of the webinar. Uh, we've also prepared some polls that will be shown during the webinar. Uh, so keep a lookout for those. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we'll be sending around the on-demand recording when it's available. Uh, so just a brief intro of myself. Uh, I'm Nikki, content lead here at Vitsi, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, I've personally spent uh, about half a decade in the film and media industry uh, with a focus on collaborating with talents and just championing storytelling from around the region. And today I'm super, super, super excited uh, to be talking with this panel of talented speakers uh, who all have had hands-on experience uh, working on a web series that tackles cyberbullying. Uh, and the most interesting part of it, the entire series, Queen of Hearts, was shot purely on mobile. Uh, so before I throw the spotlight to the speakers here, uh, I guess everyone loves awards, right? And just the idea of like winning something. So I'm going to summarize what Queen of Hearts series have accomplished so far. So Queen of Hearts has won the Worldwide Best Series at the Sao Paulo Web Fest, received several nominations from Seoul Web Fest in Korea, and nominated for all the categories at the released Web Fest in Russia. I think for Singaporean production, that's a very, very well-deserved recognition on an international stage. So now let's have everybody first introduce yourselves uh, and you can also share more about the roles you have played in Queen of Hearts. Ben, you want to go first? So, uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is uh, Benjamin. Uh, I'm a director producer working on narratives and commercials. I also crew outside um, as assistant director and the production roles. So for Queen of Hearts, um, I was director, co-director with alongside my other co-director, Alistair Quack, and we did um, episode, I think it's four, if you're watching three, sorry, <laughs> thanks for saving me there, episode three. And, and that actually features uh, Elena, who is uh, with us on the panel today. That's me. <laughs> uh, okay, so hi, my name is Elena Chu. I am an actress. I worked initially in Singapore and then I moved to further study acting in the US and then I started working in Hollywood for a while before then coming back to Singapore and I did Vitsi right after I came back from the US and currently dabbling into producing as well, but still mainly an actress. <laughs> that's it. On to Riff, yes. <laughs> yep. Hi, my name is Rufiel. Um, I am a writer, uh, director, and I uh, directed episode four of for Queen of Hearts. Um, and yeah, uh, this is my first time doing a web series. Um, so yeah. So this this almost feels like a, a like a mini class reunion, right? Since the last time you all probably saw one another is either on set or at some random festivals, or even some of you, I think you all mentioned you all worked remotely, uh, depending on the episodes you were involved in. So my my first questions will be more of understanding how your journeys were like, uh, even before Queen of Heart. Uh, took place. Uh, so maybe for Elena, you can tell us more about your background and to the moment where you chose to audition for, for Queen of Hearts. How was that journey for you like? Uh, I think for me, it was mainly because of JD. Because I worked with JD, who is the showrunner for um, Queen of Hearts. He, I worked with him before and so we did a web series a while ago for HPB actually 
And then um, that was the, I think, one of the last projects I did before I went to the US. So and then I went to the US, did my thing, and then we stayed in touch. And so, you know, sometimes he would tell me like, yeah, he has these projects. And, you know, um, it, it, he, we would just, he would just say it, you know, like in passing, right? And then it came to this one. And then he suddenly like, hey, uh, you coming back to Singapore, right? Like, yes. Are you interested in a web series? I'm like, okay, tell me about it. And then, so he told me about it and how the concept was different, how it was going to be like each episode was going to be directed by a different director and he was going to be show running it. And I was interested because, okay, um, the concept of show running is widely used in the US, right? When they, they do TV series, you will see that the show is the same, like for example, I don't know what, like um, like Suits, you know, or um, Billions. And it would be one series, but every episode has a different director. And I haven't seen that done much in Asia, like Asian productions, because usually Asian productions, you will have one whole director and one whole producer, writers this that and so i was like okay um uh, interested to see how this is going to come about right and then so and he was like okay you i will send you the script you go audition okay I'm like okay thanks <laughs> <laughs> so that's how i got involved in it uh. and yeah it was out of pure excitement <laughs> okay for, for ben was it uh almost like that straightforward or were there any conversations that you want to share when you uh that you had with uh jd before coming on as an episode director oh actually how jd found um alistair and i was that it's very funny um alistair was telling me like he was just on facebook and then suddenly a message pops up in his messenger and then it says jd Chua and it says can I call you? And like, we've never in our life we've heard of this guy called JD. <laughs> and and, and the stuff is okay, yeah. And then they had a conversation. And that's where we learned um, that, you know, JD's been working on developing Queen of Hearts. And what he was doing was actually going through all the Vitsy short films that were uploaded online. And he saw a previous book that uh, me and Alistair co-directed. Um, yeah, uh, called 0000. And it's from there, uh, he decided, okay, this is uh, a couple of guys you want to work with. So that's how he got in touch with us uh, initially. So <laughs> that was very interesting. But I think looking back now, because, you know, um, like for, uh, as Elena mentioned, this is the first time we're working on the series, web series like this, and especially one where um, we have different directors for different episodes. And then let alone for one episode, me and uh, Alistair, we are co-directing. So... I think for him to go that mile to really try and reach out to people, to talents, it's, I think, really important because um, once you have the initial conversation and once you realize that, okay, these are the guys we, uh, you know, we want to work with, then um, there's a very important element about trust because as a showrunner, you know, as much as this series or this concept is your baby, you've got to really let go and also trust the directors and the the actors and actresses and talents that you're bringing on board. So I think, yeah, that's how we met JD. That's how we came to Kingdom Hearts. Interesting. Riff, Riff, did anyone slide into your DMs? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm trying, actually, uh, since you brought that, brought that up, I can't recall how I met JD, actually. I kind of like, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, we met, before um, he approached me for this series, uh, but I think it was maybe it was the SJFF or something like that, uh, an industry event. Um, but then, uh, yeah, I think I think then uh, we didn't really like hang out or talk or meet that much. But uh, it came kind of out of the blue. Uh, uh, for for this series, how I got approached was actually I was directing uh, another short film for that slate. Uh, um, in Sin City called A Spectacular Sight. I did a short film uh, for that. And I was actually quite surprised like, that JD approached me to direct this because I was like, I already did one earlier. Then I thought he's just uh, looking and asking just 
uh, out of interest but maybe like got quota or something then i wouldn't i probably won't get it or, or whatever like so i already did one um so that kind of came out a little bit uh out of the blue i was quite surprised um and i was surprised also with the system that he was going to implement like with this show running uh kind of um, method so that kind of like uh, drew me in just because as a director doing a short film you kind of just do it on your own you're kind of like isolated and this one uh, my biggest uh, reason was to like capo all the other directors and how they work and all this kind of stuff so yeah that was that was kind of how i got into this queen of hearts that's that's interesting um i think for for myself i'm actually quite curious because i wasn't part of the set right um how how were the dynamics like on set uh, when y'all were directing your episodes, uh, was there a certain style of directing that you immediately took on or was it like a series of conversations that you had to have with the series creator? Uh, can you explain about the process before, yeah, before y'all just went in to direct? Mm, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, essentially, uh, jumping into it, he gave me a treatment uh, i'm not sure if ben did he got the same thing the treatment of the entire series uh, we didn't really know who was going to gonna do what episode or he didn't designate yet um, so it was uh, okay this is the series um, we'll talk later in terms of like how to sh uh, shoot or allocate the episodes uh, what resonates but he did like okay uh, take the treatment and figure out what episodes kind of resonate with you a little bit uh, but uh, doesn't mean you get to uh, do the one that you want the most. Um, so we had to be a bit more democratic about that. Um, definitely uh, very early on, we're just discussing uh, the overall kind of arc as a series and also just what elements are going to overlap with one another. That is one that I think uh, once we probably got the episodes that we got, um, we had to kind of like be aware uh, who is passing uh, what elements and what uh, like Baton passing, just uh, what needed to uh, kind of be set up so it can be paid off in another episode. Um, so it was a lot of just uh, initial conversation in the pre-production. I don't think in production there was that much because mine, I feel like mine was not, mine was relatively isolated in that, uh, in that sense. Not sure about Ben's episode. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, when JD said it's all up, uh, in its own way, it can be very self-contained because it really follows. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think I mentioned once to understand it's almost like four different short films coming together, and then, but uh, there is still a level of. I mean, JD has created this, has done his world building. Really, he's really have, he has all the characters in his head, how he interlinked, and like you know, uh, Riff mentioned that's all um, shared with us during pre-production. Uh, we were given prep we were, told to okay if you have a preference for episode go for it but it doesn't mean you get it and i think for our episode um you know when we have elena and all that it's a very different world because like she's this other um influencer wannabe who's a musician it's very different from the other characters who you know plus one it's a it's a bit of a, a, a pervert kind of thing so um as much as they're sort of not directly related there's still the passing of the baton like uh, Riff mentioned all the ele other elements making sure that you know tonally it's not such a, a great shift huh? because um, when JD I think got all of us on board as directors he is very aware of the kind of styles and the kind of strengths that we can bring to a series so he has that uh, fun or tricky job as a showrunner to to sort of make sure that despite all different styles and strengths, we still deliver the vision that uh, he needs. Uh. So I think when the more we talk to him during the pre-pro production, we got a sense of, okay, he has this master plan. So it's how best within our styles and abilities can we help to, you know, help him achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Just shout out to Joan who who reminded me that uh he introduced me to JD at SJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. Uh, so. Uh, credit to join yourself for this my involvement in this series <laughs> just like whatsapp me and I just saw 
Yeah, I remember. Careful, the walls have ears. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. He's here in the. Yeah, he's, he's. Hi, hi, Joanne. Hello. Uh, we we just uh we just uh put out the first poll out there, uh, asking uh all of you uh, attendees, how many of you have watched the Queen of Hearts series? The poll hasn't ended, but right now I'm seeing like sixty percent saying not yet. Uh, so that's interesting uh, of you to tune in to this session. Uh, maybe this question can before Elena um, if you want to inform the attendees who haven't watched Queen of Hearts series uh, if there can be uh, perhaps a way to summarize what this series is all about uh, and also what drawn you to this uh, this particular role that you have played uh, in this series uh, yeah can take this moment to share um, I think okay the to summarize Queen of Hearts, right, it's about this influencer named Tori, and she is this very popular influencer, and um, throughout the five episodes, we will see how different people um, perceive, or, you know, how, how we will see different uh, faces of people, like, like, stakeholders who are involved, you know, like, uh, fans, stalkers, um rivals or like competitors like my character wants to be like Tori in in a sense um I my character like I'm a musician and I have my own followers and yet I feel this discontent because Tori is so much more popular than me and so you know you see how this one central uh, influencer impacts the lives of so many and so in the different different episodes it kind of discusses these different different people's lives and yeah and the fact that you know what I shouldn't spoil it what happens to her <laughs> yeah don't spoil it go watch the series <laughs> go watch the series and um the reason how how why I was interested um I think okay back then I had red hair Right. When I was in the US, I had red hair. Um, and JD was like, hey, I can use your red hair. Like, For what? Because <laughs> usually, okay, um, the kind of roles that I get in the US, right, are like either punk rockers, druggies, junkies, like, re uh, like rebellious teenager, high schooler, that type of thing. And I was totally fine. That was like my comfort zone. And so, and then he was like, hey, um, this. So he explained to me, right, like like I said earlier, like he explained to me what it's about and like the character I would play. I'm like, oh, that sounds very interesting. Okay, so essentially, this is not a story about just me. This is a story about um, how I respond to this other person who is Tori, who is central to the, like who is the red string that will tie all these um, episodes together. So I thought that was a very interesting concept. Mm. Can you share with us uh, what were your rehearsals like uh, working with Ben as well? Uh, what have you learned from uh, yeah, being involved in the Queen of Hearts series? Just looking at it as a whole now that yeah, it's, it's all wrapped and done and some years have passed <laughs> on <laughs> hindsight. <laughs> in hindsight, it was very fun though. Like, I have to say, um, especially because that was my first time shooting with a, a, a phone, right? Like, uh, like can we mention brand here or not? Like, uh, just say phone, yeah? Okay, oh, yeah, phone. phone. <laughs> like, we got with a phone. It was a mobile phone. And um, so Ben and Ali, very creative directors. So they were trying to figure out new angles on how to take certain things. Like, for example, there's a car shot. Everybody knows a car shot, right? Like, if you're a filmmaker, you know what a car shot will look like. You know how you'll set up your camera. But these two directors decided they were going to take, you know, they were going to push the limits of like how compact this phone is. And you're like, you know what? We can capture this angle. And then everybody will be in the car. <laughs> and it was a bizarre situation where me and my co-star, Jamison, would be, okay, so the scene is we're fighting. So we're both seated up front. And Jameson is driving and I'm on the side. And then, so they want to capture this angle and then everybody will be cramming in the back seat of the 
cut. And you know, it would otherwise be impossible because usually when if you if you're shooting with a big camera, the camera itself wouldn't fit into that space. But now they are going to cramp the small camera and the director and the sound man. So <laughs> it was very interesting. It was very fun. Looking back, it was very fun. Maybe so you guys can ex expand on that, how you felt, because you were the one who actually did it, right? I was just comfortably sitting in front yeah, of Yeah, so uh, first shout out to, you know, Jameson also, who's playing the uh, opposite, <laughs> uh, directly opposite Elena, and shout out also to James here, our uh, beloved director of photography, <laughs> who was a contortionist on the car scene. <laughs> so what happened was... Because, contortionist. Because Elena is in the passenger seat, right? She's arguing with Jameson and uh, someone had to drive the car and the angle was because it was moving so um, J so our deep, uh, James had to move the camera sort of into position the only way for to do that was if I was driving the car and then James was like somehow we got the seat down and it's like leaning back using me as a backrest literally to get the shot off Elena so if you see a little bit of camera shake there that's James trying to um, not not die uh, <laughs> I mean this so uh yeah, I think shooting with a phone, definitely me and Alistair uh went a bit uh crazy with some of the initial ideas we had and they were telling JD, okay, we can do this, we can do this with the phone, and then I was like, okay, wait a minute. As much as you know we have that style, it has to sort of uh, fit tonally. So we still got away with some of the shots we wanted. Uh but yeah, I think shooting with a phone can allow you to just it's easier because you can sometimes you just really plant it and just go. And it's so much easier to get in position sometimes. Um, of course, there's still challenges, especially when you're working on a phone on this kind of long series. And also when you, even though it's just a phone, you're still working with uh, a, a full crew, like basically for lighting and sound and all that. So they've got to um, find a way to make it work so for a phone. But yeah, I think it was fun, definitely. Mm. I think yeah, and um, the 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 interesting aspect here is that I think not a lot of people realize that this uh this series was shot on mobile, um so perhaps like sharing some of the behind the scenes either challenges or the ways that you yeah literally have to <laughs> contort yourself to make the shot happen. Uh, were there any? differences or similarities working on conventional sets versus shooting with mobile phones um, do you all feel there's a there's a difference in there or it's actually pretty much sim sim that's a yeah i think looking back i think that it's still uh, i think how the set works is still the same um, you know we've got You've got the same, you've got makeup, you've got art, you've got everything, and the coordination exactly is, is however much you put it. But I think shooting for foam because of this size, there's a certain kind of uh, freedom um, because the camera you know, physically can take up, yeah, we, we rig it up, it takes up uh, physically quite a bit of space and bulk. But as Elena said, now that it's so small, um, I've heard some of the other... Um, actors and actresses that when the phone is like so close, or I think Elena mentioned this, when the phone is so small and so close to you, you sort of forget that it's there because we're so used to it already in our daily lives. And then whether it's rolling or not, it's like, oh, okay, we're doing that. And then, but uh, we've got the thing that you need. So, um, so yeah, to answer that to me, um, it's same, same, but different um, in a way. But I think definitely it helps uh, keep things a bit tighter on set. Lah. I mean, that's for me. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, pretty much the same like what Ben said which is like the process is still the same but I think some things you just discover that you can uh, kind of do uh, easier than before or even harder than before like for example because you're having a smaller uh, camera essentially uh, the ergonomics you have to take into consideration that you know uh, your slight hand tremble is is much uh, bigger as a camera shake uh, but then uh, you also find like oh you can speed a lot of things up like for example I had a whole scene one scene where uh, Velnice comes back with uh, uh, drinks uh, to put in the fridge and I think uh, James was like 
how do we shoot this? Uh, how do we bring her in into the room, have her put in the thing uh, and make it interesting? And I was like, the phone is smaller than the fridge. Why don't you just put the phone inside the fridge? So she just opens it and then puts in the uh, drinks and then just closes it again. Um, and we were, it wasn't like we're trying to show off what the camera can do, but we just it just is a natural process of like, Hmm, okay, we, we can do that. That seems the most efficient and the most appropriate. Then let's just try and do that. And yeah, we did that for that scene, which was, um, I think you could have overcomplicated it if you um, tried to make it look like uh, a showing off the iPhone rather than the, the phone itself than anything else. I agree with. Uh, we also had you know the same car shot. So if you wanted to get a frontal shot of everyone, the driver, the passenger, and the back passenger, usually what you do for a car is you got to set up a car rig and car rigs takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got them on the camera outside. Sometimes you get the operator there. So, and there's a lot of safety elements going on. But with the iPhone, you can just put it way up to the front windscreen mm -hmm. and just uh, secure it there and just roll it. But then again, also, you know, like Riff said, it comes with its own set of challenges because in this case, our phone is right up against the glass of the windscreen and James couldn't see the screen on where's the record button. So he had to like, oh, put his head. so our CA, Jolina, had to be standing outside and then James fingers there and she said, go left, left. <laughs> okay, tap, tap the record. Okay, and then, and then recording. So there's a lot of that. Um, it's like a Japanese game show, right? <laughs> kind of like direct people. Okay, move it is, slightly, uh... slightly. <laughs> <laughs> It is, uh, I think, the amount of hijinks with uh, they had the phone. Yeah, makes a good story. Yeah. I think, yeah, now now that we mentioned, I think it's okay to mention the brand. La. So, yeah, it's iPhone. Marketed is that, right? Yeah, I iPhone. The thing is just out. So, it has better batteries, better camera lens. Uh, I was just watching a small trailer about how the new iPhone is uh, something to look forward to. Uh, do do y'all... Do you all have the intention to continue on this, uh, this way of storytelling, uh, which is specifically like mobile storytelling? Um, actually love to hear your thoughts about it uh, because I do know that some people, some filmmakers are leaning towards mobile just because yeah, nowadays in current times, all you have is literally a phone uh, that you depend on. Uh, and that's the resources you have. Uh, and usually if you shoot indoors, phone is what you need. Um, do you all have any thoughts on uh, mobile storytelling? Something that you want to do more in future or yeah, you have other thoughts? <laughs> I think it. what phone, um, you know, having shot some stuff mobile since, you know, for fun and for other projects is that shooting on the phone for me gives you access like um, sure, there are technical limitations. You know, phones can't do low light very well. Um, that for few. I mean, now that iPhone 13 is there for few, it's a whole different uh, ball game. But I think access, because especially when you start to, if you need to get like a sneaky shot, on, but this is, um, I did not do this. I'm just saying, if you do a sneaky shot off, like you want to shot on the bus or on the train, you can just put your phone up right there and get a shot. You know, um, and you don't have to worry about. Um, going through all the loopholes. Uh, I'm just going through all the paperwork and all the red tape just for the one shot, you know, that adds to your film. And when you're talking, when you have people who are real, when you're talking to real subjects and you're, let's say, doing like a mini docu or something, it's the, the difference between having, you know, a big camera where it attracts a lot of attention and sometimes when you put it in a person's face, suddenly they go blank and they can't speak at all. They get nervous. But when you just put a phone there, you start talking to them. After a while, you realize, okay, it's almost invisible. So I think, yeah, access to me is what really makes a phone um, something, yeah, I'll definitely work with again. Uh, I mean, for me, it's always just comes back to uh, whether you need it. Uh, it comes back from the story again. Just uh, And the other thing is, like, doesn't mean now that you can do... Um, it all on your care uh, on your phone uh, doesn't mean you kind of have to like just abandon everything else before it's just another sort of like tool in your toolbox you're just expanding it so you could um, do mixed media where you're kind of like doing mostly on your film camera or whatever and then like Ben said uh, you need something more specific like something a bit more um, I think he said sneaky 
Um, but yeah, then you you have uh, the option of going to a smaller camera and it just means you can do it. Uh, you have more freedom just being able to uh, choose from so many different options of cameras. Yeah. Interesting. For Elena, any differences for you? Uh, I think previously you mentioned to me, it's just camera pointing, <laughs> pointing in my direction, and then but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like um, as as a performer, right? Then it it doesn't really matter, <laughs> cause you, you know the director says roll, then starts rolling off, you know, and director says cut, you cut. But um, I do think that there is a benefit to mobile um storytelling and mobile like using mobile phones to shoot because I think it will be much more accessible for people in general you see and also if well maybe with the older phones you're gonna get some difficulty in terms of like um focus like like the depth of focus right like Ben said earlier but you know the new iPhone has actually overcome that so I feel that um, from here onwards, it's just going to get better and easier to shoot with phones in general. And also, um, yeah, for guerrilla shooting, definitely. <laughs> I think that will be like a, a plus. And also, because now they shoot in 4K, so it's really, I don't know. I mean, to you guys, is there a difference? like? Riff, Ben, like, is there a difference in quality if you shoot like with just a an SLR, I guess, and with a phone? Is the quality really apparent? Very different? You think? Yeah, I think it's it's still very apparent. Um, mm. I think people would like to compare, uh, or oh, it's how close it is, uh, whether it can match. And to me, I don't think that's really the point, um, because they're really two different. Be sure. You know, a lot of even feature films, they sneak in like one or two iPhone shots. You can't tell the difference. But um, uh, quality-wise, of course, the cinema camera is going to give you better quality, same as the SLR, just because of the way uh, it processes images. And, um, but that shouldn't be a limiting factor in, in really why you want to shoot. I think Riff puts it very aptly. It's, these are just tools in your toolbox. You want to shoot with a Lomo camera, you want to shoot with a GoPro or 360 cam, you know, that's all these are different options huh, to tell stories and it depends on what you really need. Interesting. I think, yeah, with um, with uh, adapting to mobile shooting, uh, there's definitely a set of challenges. Uh, for Elena's side, right, do you have any interesting incidents that you want to share where you, you tried to problem solve on set or behind the scenes, uh, coming back to Queen of Hearts series, uh, were there any uh, interesting cases that you want to bring up? Like for the shooting process itself or for the like like the filmmaking side or the acting side? Uh, your role, yeah. The oh, acting role. side, yeah. Any complaints uh, you have with me, Alistair? <laughs> no, no, I, no, no. It was, it was a very like honestly, it was one of the easiest shoots I had. It was like very fun. It was very chill, and directors were very chill. They gave me a lot of space to, uh, explore. Okay, because um, some actors work better in a more like a a, a lone environment, and some be some others work better with a partner, right? Like, for example, like, you know, like the Meisner technique, that's what actors call it. Like, when you have a partner in the scene, then you just play off of them. And I think that really helped because also in the rehearsal process, me and my co-star, Jameson, we were given that breadth of, of space and, you know, time to explore how we wanted to um, reach certain emotions and reach cer certain uh, checkpoints in the scene and I think Ben and Ali both gave very good so it's like they give us this play pen and then they're like outside telling us if we are going offside you know so like but if, while we're still within that you know uh, play pen it was a safe area for us to just explore and try things and I thought that was a, a great environment for the actors. 
I really, really was grateful for that. Yeah. Because, like, there, there, I mean, this, my character is very emotional. And then you just, you, like, from the beginning of the, see, the, the episode, you're just waiting for her to blow up one. Because you know it's coming. <laughs> and then, so that needed to be rehearsed. And that needed, like, a, a trust as well with my co like with my co-actor and I feel like we achieved that and that is also thanks to the directors obviously hmm I have a question uh for for Riff um because I think uh in our earlier chat sessions you know you're mentioning some creative ways uh that you went about to build a sort of a rapport with your right. Right. Your cast. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you share that with yeah with us? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, I think the biggest uh, thing for me as a director is just um, your actors. It's it's they don't have anyone else uh, but the director. They can have uh, their co uh, stars or whatever, but that's not really. Uh, it could end up being exacerbating your own sort of insecurities or if you're already in the wrong area that might just make it worse where you're both kind of like perpetuating something uh, a little bit offbeat but yeah I mean I tend to try and make sure that I can you know uh, befriend or like have some sort of like understanding with with the actors so um, getting to the point uh, my rehearsal was uh, was mainly a table read and that was slightly that was largely because also uh, my episode was mostly dialogue of people in rooms seated down and just talking. So there was not much that I could kind of like uh, break out of that. And we were doing it for a while. And when we finished, it didn't seem like we, it felt very formal, uh, just like talking, talking back and forth, just going through lines. So in the end, me and Adele uh, went to one side and just started playing uh, table tennis. We just saw a table tennis table and we're like, do they have the bats and the ball and stuff? And I was like, hmm, let me go and find. And then there was, so we just started playing. And it wasn't just because we are bored or whatever. It was also just me thinking we should probably try and, you know, um, find a way to like uh, connect a little bit more. That's not just like on paper. That's not just about uh, work. Uh, we I There is a level of trust that you need from one another and you kind of have to spend time you just have to like um, talk to them about other things about uh, other than the the script sometimes so that's kind of like what we did me and Adele uh, I would say the script read was maybe like 15 20 percent of the time and then everything else was like playing games and then relaxing and then just um, doing other things like we did fitting and whatever and mostly just talking from there as well so yeah uh and I think uh, aside from me, I think one scene also was uh, was doing something weird with her actors, or not weird, <laughs> but, but like uh, doing something other than just a, a traditional rehearsal, which was I think she was playing catching with them, we were running around in the rehearsal room, and I was like, yeah. "What is happening? Why are they screaming and all this kind of stuff?" I was like concerned at first, and then it was just like, "Oh, they're, they're rehearsing," um, but in a in a sort of like bonding uh, session that was more than just like, oh, what's your intention? What is your uh, uh, your beat here? Yeah. Mm. So playing catching and playing ping pong. You know, you could <laughs> yeah. do that more often probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pixel very big to run around. Yeah. <laughs> For Ben, right, um, were, were there like um, specific moments uh, or maybe you can expand on like, is there a particular episode uh, that you went back to work with the showrunner JD to to solve a problem. Uh, was there like a specific instance where you had to go back to your showrunner to discuss more about the creative vision or some some creative decisions there? I think um, a lot of the initial conversation I mentioned happens in the pre pro. So when it really came down to to the production itself, um, it wasn't so much more on on. I mean, there were fires to fight on 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 any shoots, um, basically. But like creatively for this episode, 
um, like I mentioned, there's that level of trust that we've established already, like um, when we discussed previously. And once we understood where he was coming from, and once he understood um, how much to let these two boys go and um, play around with the episode, that's where um, you know he can really just um, not take a back seat, but just take a step back and focus on how the whole series is uh, going to be glued together. So um, challenges with the episode, I think um, there was a fair amount of um, things going on because uh, we, we first need to understand um, you know, how, what is um, Elena's character's relation to, to Tori, Pris, relation to Tori. We also have to understand um, why is he trying to get out of this episode and I think he sets that direction very clear from the beginning. So there wasn't too much ambiguity. A lot of the problems then comes from, oh, um, you know, how do we get this uh, done on the day itself? Because, uh, you know, there are technical limited, uh, limitations with the phones and things like that. Um, but it's always good to know that um, at every step of the way that showrunner is there, fighting not just the creative problems also but all the logistical problems and that really gives you the freedom um, to go and focus on, on what needs to be done which is to to tell the story of the episode to work with the actors um, and you know he is he is like um, well not like the godfather like but he's like <laughs> a guardian angel sort of really because when when things um, do go wrong in like a series of episodes he, like he is there to to make sure everything goes well and to make sure that they can continue and and you can achieve what you need to achieve at the end of the day so that's quite important mm. the godfather like I'll make you a, mafia a style you yeah you can't refuse <laughs> that kind of thing <laughs> I think JD himself he calls the function as a Producer, writer, director rolled into one uh, music conductor, crisis solver, yeah, psychiatrist, yeah, no a nurturing <laughs> parent, a walking Wikipedia, a lot of uh, creative terms to it. Um, actually, we have a closely related question coming from Q&A uh, from Juan himself. Um, his question is, with more serialized content, show running, bracket creative producing is common. How did you all discuss and settle creative differences? Mm. Ah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the, the biggest, the simplest sort of cliche is just communicate, just have to talk about it a lot and try and see from the other perspective. But also the other uh, issue is actually whose responsibility it then ends up becoming. Um, at the end of the day, um, you might have your own sort of like isolated idea of what this is supposed to look like. But um, again, the other thing is you're not alone. And it's the strength and the issues that you have to deal with uh, being not alone uh, in this kind of like format. Um, you kind of have to like, in some way, uh, give and take. You get a lot from being able to discuss with other people, but you also have to give as much, you know. Um, so that's one of the biggest thing that it's not just about the series, but in any short film or, or whatever endeavor, you just have to communicate uh, clearly and then also try to understand uh, whose responsibility it is, who, who has like, stakes, bigger stakes, or even who, sometimes even it can just be who's uh, going to get, um, I would say, uh, pin, the, the issue is pin on uh, if it doesn't work out or whatsoever. So there is responsibility in being the biggest or the leader or whatsoever. And you have to also understand uh, that, um, yeah, you're not uh, your own uh, boss uh, all the time. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think also it's to, to avoid all these, you know, um, conflicts, again, we said uh, is communication. And also at the very start, I think it's alignment because the alignment has to really come from 
uh, the showrunner la, and the showrunner um, has to, like I said, in a walking Wikipedia, has to know their stuff and has to know and has to take um, not just the directors, but the actress and the actors through uh, what their arc is and what that um, end point is and what that journey is going to look like. And, you know, if let's say you're working on something as, um, as ambitious or as high budget as that Star Wars The Mandalorian, where John Favreau, creator of Iron Man, and uh, things like that, uh, director of Iron Man, sorry, and he is the showrunner. He knows the law inside out with Dave Filoni, but he assigns it to, again, five different directors, all very, uh, very experienced and, and direction or so, but still keeping to the core of what John has envisioned for the series. So I think the alignment is important from the very beginning because once that is done, right, everything else, you know, is such a pleasant experience because you are really just focused on um, what you're doing. Um, you know, also, again, you're not working on this alone. So yeah, it can be a lot of fun once all that is done in the early stages. Hmm. Alina, uh, were there any dramatic situations? <laughs> I think there's nothing so dramatic. But <laughs> I mean, I do think that maybe, like, because I recently started venturing into producing, right? And so I do understand i think the benefits of working with a showrunner like if you're a showrunner and then because okay i've never done show running i think it's going to be a, a way above what skill sets i have right now right but having a showrunner like what they said would um be very helpful for directors but i don't know honestly whether uh, directors will feel stifled creatively by it or what because I mean I'm sure it's a different style right it, I mean like if you're directing all five episodes then you have your own vision of what it's supposed to look like and how you want it to be like whereas having a showrunner is kind of like having a boss that you have to answer to still you know creatively and stuff so it's actually quite interesting to hear also from Riff and Ben whether that's more um, having a showrunner is a good direction or like a more stifling thing like creatively for them. I do want to know actually. It depends on your showrunner, yeah. <laughs> the show oh, that's true. The really because, yeah. That's true, that's true. Yeah, because I'm I'm quite interested. I'm quite curious. Why is it so popular to do that? Like in in for US TV shows, but not in Asia. You see, like, is it because of control? Is it because mm -hmm. of like communication trust issues that you're trying to, um, like uh, that's one variable you're trying to eliminate or what? You know, like. Mm. We have a, I think we have a director in the midst of our attendees. Um, the question is, is there a series Bible to guide the creative vision at pre-pro? Uh, and how much is changed after the scripts are locked? <laughs> there. Hmm. Was there okay, so, so at least I'll answer it uh, a little bit. We had the treatment and we have the scripts, um, which we still had. Uh, I think one or two more drafts of like revisions that were still going to go through, uh, which we would be able to give input on um, suggestions of altering a few things uh, before it gets locked. Um, is that, am I saying it right, Ben? Yeah, yes, exactly okay. that. Yeah. Um, but uh, in our first sort of like massive meeting, which was not just the directors, it included the um, other um, heads of departments, um, we all sort of like uh, on the day uh, discussed and came to consensus on certain styles and looks. So while we didn't uh, formalize it in a um, series Bible or whatever, which um, I think timeline wise, we didn't really uh, have that uh, for, for this type of, of series. Um, I think um, you had, uh, um, we had a PPM, like we had uh, like a, a sort of like references and images of, of things. And we ref 
talked about what other films that uh, that it might look like, I think, uh, or had before. So it was much more organic in terms of just discussing uh, certain things. But I think the other thing with this was that each, each episode had the liberty to be a little bit more unique. So we didn't have to be tied down to a, a series Bible and a specific vision. Obviously, there were certain things that element-wise we knew we were going to share but that's more on a resource sort of like level of like, okay, we're all shooting it on an iPhone. Not, nobody is going to shoot something on a different uh, camera or whatever. And then we also knew that we would have um, screen images, like uh, screenshot sort of like type of images um, in the style of Sherlock uh, and stuff like that. So we knew that, um, but nobody, uh, nobody, and we discussed how that would actually look like, but we didn't um, start uh, formalizing it uh, in a, a Bible because I think it's it's still in a weird way, a small scale sort of a series, uh, even though it's quite big in scope, uh, your, your elements are still kind of like specific, yeah. Mm. And I think if, sorry, uh, if you're talking about um, how you maintain the consistency, um, really, I think, yeah, as Riff mentioned, you know, you're shooting on the same phone, the screens, the designs are the same. And, and then I think most importantly is so that even though we have five different directors, we have one um, DOP throughout the whole series. So that maintains a level of consistency, at least visually. Yeah, uh, like we discuss other people's uh, visual elements as well a little bit. Um, so we had like, okay, mine didn't have that much of like, the uh, in-world Instagram or whatever uh, text stuff, but uh, I still gave input of like, oh, uh, how would it look like? How will it move? Um, just because I, I want to know what else is happening uh, outside of my own sort of like episode as well. Mm. There is a specific question uh, directed to Ben uh, about co-directing the episode with another director. Was there a specific role each of the director took on set and how did this dynamic affect the actors? <laughs> uh, I don't know, like talking to two different, very different people, like, <laughs> like two childs on set. I think like, how, I feel like... Hmm. Okay, uh, from my perspective, I feel like I'm talking to the same brain cell. So <laughs> <laughs> Brain cell? No, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like talking to a single brain cell, like same, like the same person. Because they are, I, I don't know, I think because you guys have been friends for a while and you guys, you know, the relationship merges you into one person, I think. Yeah, we we have enough brain cells on our own to share that one cell um, between the both of us. We we take turns to share the cell if we need it in our own personal lives. But uh, Alyssa and I, <laughs> we've uh, been working together since um, Polytechnic, so that's how we met. And I think how we've formed that uh, relationship as uh, collaborators is um, you know, we like the same kind of uh, genre, the films, and um, you know, thriller stuff, action stuff, and that's where our sensibilities sort of um, are sort of, yeah, we have common sensibilities in that, in, in, in that sense, but yeah, at the same time, we also have uh, our own preferences to things, so like he is, he, he prefers more of the horror action stuff, whereas I, I like the more, um, the stuff that are a bit more still. So coming together with all our projects, um, it's always, um, yeah, it's always, it can be Alistair going all crazy and then me sort of being the wet blanket a little bit, like the voice of reason. So, um, and I think creatively when it comes to this, right, because um, both of us really want to see how much you can push with an episode like that, especially visually, that's really a lot of give and take also, a lot about, okay, um, this this is great but does it really work for the scene does it work for the character you know as much as you can do so much with that so um it's a lot of discussion uh between co-directors uh it's a give and take specific specific roles um it depends i mean it can be helpful because you know i uh like i could be talking to the to the actors where he can be talking to let's say james our camera our DOP, 
So that's where you see the one brain share being shared. At least that information is, uh, we can spread ourselves out a bit uh, more efficiently. But also, I think it really helps uh, when we co-direct that like we have someone to bounce this off. Because like Riff said, when you're working on a short film alone, when you're working on a series alone, it's really just you. And like you have no gauge on, you don't have anyone who will be on the same level as you critically to, to really critique whether something works or not whether, um, yeah, so I think that's the benefit of having, you know, a co-director on set. And yeah, I think when it comes to opportunities like this, uh, yeah, that's where uh, you really see, like, as in when you, when we are together like that, like in our series, we just, yeah, talking to the same person, effectively. Yeah, no, um, I think it's, it's more like you can hear a director brainstorming out loud. <laughs> like like when they're setting up a shot for example and then they you know because like i think if, if you're on your own right as a director you have to have these thoughts internally and then you have to debate should i just like do that or you know like how should i set this up and then you would hear them do it audibly and then in a way it does reassure the actors you know um me at least it because, you know, you, you hear them talking about it, you hear them setting up, and then, at, you know, from the side, then you're like, oh, okay, I am beginning to understand what is going to happen. And then, so that kind of prepares me a little bit right before they, like, stage me. Like, hey, you, you know, where they would before, like, you know, they give me the markings and this, that, and I think it's, it's a lovely process. Mm, very good insights here. Uh, I'm afraid we are reaching the closing of the webinar already, so I, I may not be able to cover all the questions in the Q&A, uh, but it's maybe just as a, as a closing question, um, is there a specific message that you want to share with uh, potential showrunners out there, you know, people who aspire to do... Uh, web series or even mobile series, um, do you have a, a message in mind that you want to share based on your Queen of Hearts experience so far? Perhaps something more uplifting? <laughs> I think what Elena talked about, um, you know, being able to hear uh, a director think, I think that's kind of like an interesting sort of like thing for, for people to try show running if they've never um, done it before, which is like, see how other people work, see what the discussion is like, and be able to like, essentially uh, not be the only person uh, kind of like talking to yourself, uh, trying to figure out and uh, having an isolated uh, um, dread of insecurity all the time. You can kind of share a little bit of work, off the, take the burden off your shoulders a little bit, you know, just uh, creativity, you know, uh, likes company. You just need to multiply uh, with other people and get inspired by other people as well. So it's kind of like uh, fun. And, you know, if you can, uh, obviously there might be issues and whatever, but if you can, you know, leave your ego uh, out, you can really kind of like uh, explore in, in kind of like very different ways of making films. So yeah, go do show running, go make series with other people. Should you on the phone? Yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you know if the the poll is like whether you want to see a season two, right? I think if there is a season two, um, I do believe that Queen of Hearts should maintain this type of format just so that it can inspire more um people to adopt a similar thing so that it's it's more I mean like practice makes perfect and as more people do it I believe that you know like this show running format with different directors I think it will it should be able to catch on and when done efficiently and done well I think it will um, bring a better like a bigger boost you know like in, in filmmaking as a whole you know because if the US people have been doing it and they keep on doing it, then there must be, it must have some merits, right? You know, and yeah. Yeah, I think uh, like what I was mentioned earlier, I think series is, you know, bigger than yourself as a director working on one thing. Um, it's really a collaborative process. So I think first whoever's stepping in that 
whatever egos there are, it really has to be left at the door because you're coming into this very collaborative process where people will suggest things that are maybe it will work definitely for your episode, even though they're not involved with it at all. And, you know, you've got to be like, hey, yeah, actually that works. Or if that doesn't work, then you guys can, you know, constructively talk about um, what could happen instead. And I think being a showrunner, um, it's really about, yeah, because once you put that ego aside, it's really about trust. And once you have that trust established that, okay, these guys can can go and um, fulfill this master plan, this vision that we have, then, you know, that's that really helps everyone focus on the creative process. And I think also the important function of a showrunner is not just about the creativity, the story. You've got to have a neck also for, for pulling people together. So that's how we've got all of us here in this room today. And you, not just beyond directors and actors, but also people like your art team, your camera team, your lighting crew and wardrobe, makeup. All these are so important also to the process. And that is also, you know, like I said, it's really a skill or talent that a showrunner must have to pull the best of these people together. And then it was such a nice process because the team was fantastic because yeah, they found the right people for the right job. So uh, that's very important as well. Oh, that's so heartwarming. <laughs> it's like virtual yeah. hugs to everybody now. <laughs> but yeah, um, we, yeah, I think a majority of the attendees here would love to see Queen of Hearts season two. Hin Hin JD or Hin Hin Apple. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, I think we are coming to a close here. I hope you get to learn uh, more insights behind the making of a series through the lens of the directors and cast here. A huge thank you to our speakers, Benjamin, Rafael and Elena for sharing your behind the scenes experiences and really kudos to the entire Queen of Hearts team for making it possible. Uh, we appreciate your feedback here. So if you can just take five minutes to fill up uh, in the link, we dropped it in the chat, uh, the link to the feedback form, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, so today's webinar is part of Vitsi Jury Awards, uh, our commitment to grow a network of storytellers and inspire a new generation of storytellers across Asia. So this year, you will find jury all virtual, allowing us to keep Everyone connected through social cinema screenings, insightful talks like this, and a live award ceremony in October. So stay connected with us uh, with news on our socials. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, wherever. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.